um, this afternoon or this evening. Um, uh, we want to begin this evening's session. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we really do pray for thank you for each and every thing. Lord, we thank you for um, life, health, strength, and even above all those things, we thank you for the relationship that we have with your son, Jesus. And he is our redeemer and our savior from our sin and all things connected to it. And our eternity rests upon him and his cross, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and not anything that is in us. And so, Lord, we praise you and thank you for that. Lord, as we uh, go to your word once again to a very controversial subject, Lord, open up our eyes that we may see uh, what your word says, and then let us submit ourselves to the scriptures as we learn these important truths. Father, we pray these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, I will just, before I begin this evening, um, I'm just going to read to you um, my responsibilities as a pastor and the charge God has given to me as a pastor before I begin this evening's lecture in order that you will know the perspective I'm trying real hard to address this subject from. And it's just 2 Timothy 4 and 5. 4, four really 1 through 5. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing the kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside from myths. But you, and so I take it that God is speaking to me tonight, but you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So this is part of me fulfilling my ministry in light of the fact that I've been charged in the presence of God and His Son, Jesus Christ, to preach the Word, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. So that's how I'm approaching this subject. And the subject is illegal immigration and border control. As always, uh, I'll, I'll get through the lecture and then I'll open up the floor for comments, questions, and before I get started, can everybody please sign us their phones? Yeah. You know, sometimes I'm lecturing, I hear that, 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 that. <laughs> kind of throws me off. So please sign us your phones. Um, buzz, whatever, buzzing or whatever you put them on. Illegal immigration and border control. You know, back when I, when I did the first one of these this year, I made a statement that the scriptures always have the best answers to life's most perplexing problems. And uh, that is not true just doctrinally with, 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 you know, theological things, salvation, redemption, but really the Bible has something to say about every important issue that we will face in our lifetimes. And so I think the same is true with this illegal immigration and border control. So according to the most, so after I lecture, questions, comments, and I want to say, no one has to agree with everything that I say, but I'm trying real hard to um, keep this strictly biblical. And uh, you know, none of us think totally alike. We see things from different perspectives. But my job as a pastor is to try to encourage all of us to think biblically or according to a biblical worldview. Not, about, not just about this, but about everything. Because this is what God requires of all of us and it is how we'll be judged by God. Having said that, according to the most recent statistics from the Department of Homeland Security, 
Approximately 11 million illegal or unauthorized immigrants are living in the United States. The current political landscape is filled with ugly, divisive rhetoric and debate on how to best regulate illegal immigration. The best course of action to deal with illegal immigrants already residing in the U.S. and the economic impact of illegal immigration on the American economy. Despite these contentious issues, the primary concern for the church is neither political nor economic. But how should we as Christians address illegal immigration or according to sound theological and pastoral positions? Let me, let me read that again. Despite these contentious issues, the primary concern for the church is neither political nor economic, but how should we as Christians address illegal immigration according to sound theological and pastoral positions? As such, this lecture will not address illegal immigration from a politically right or politically left bias but instead focus on illegal immigrants who are Christians and how the church should deal with issues surrounding illegal immigration. The illegal Christians, Christian immigrants responsibility, government. From a general perspective, it is the Christian's duty to obey laws established by the government where they reside. This is clearly taught in scriptural passages such as Romans 13, 1 through 2. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed or received condemnation upon themselves. And so very clear that Christians are to abide by or subject themselves to the laws that are established wherever they reside. The text is also very clear that these governmental authorities ultimately um, they are established by God and who, whoever resists uh, these laws of the government, it says it here, you are, for, you are opposing the ordinance of God. So once again, the problem is not government, the problem is God. And it's very clear that they who have opposed or received condemnation upon themselves seem to suggest that we're all going to give an account. The Romans 13, 1 through 2. The only exception to this command is when government establishes laws that result and believers disobeying God based on what he has revealed in the scriptures. A little footnote there, Acts 5, 29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. And in that text, um, the governing authorities had commanded them not to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. But they did it anyways. Because that particular law was conflicting with what God had commanded them to do. So they call it civil disobedience when the government tries to force us to do something umbilical, and then we are obligated to follow God rather than man, but then we must be willing to pray the consequences of that, whatever they may be. Currently, nothing in U.S. immigration law requires Christians to disobey God. Let me say it again. Currently, Nothing in U.S. immigration law requires Christians to disobey God. As a matter of scriptural fact, it is biblical for a nation to protect its borders and therefore control who enters it. For example, 2 Chronicles 14, uh, 2 through 7 gives us the following truth concerning the nation protecting its borders. Asa did good and right in the sight of the Lord his God. For he removed the foreign altars and high places, tore down the sacred pillars, cut down the ashen, and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to observe the law and the commandments. He also removed the high places and the incense altars from all the cities of Judah, and the kingdom was undisturbed under him. He built fortified cities in Judah, 
since the land was undisturbed. There was no one at war with him during those years because the Lord God had given him rest. For he said to Judah, let us build these cities and surround them with walls and towers and gates and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We have sought him and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. The building of walls, towers, gates, and bars around the city after, after seeking the Lord. It suggests God wanted you to protect its borders and determine who would come into its domain. There is also the biblical word truth recorded in the first seven chapters of the book of Nehemiah. Uh, and a crisis faced the city of Jerusalem. Its walls, which should have served to protect its borders, were in a deplorable condition. And it reads like this in Nehemiah 1, 1 through 3. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now what happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year when I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and survived captivity in about Jerusalem. They said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived captivity are in great distress and reproach. And the wall of the city is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And of course, we, those of us who are familiar with the Old Testament, we know the ordeal, Nehemiah and the men at the face and repairing the walls and the walls serve to protect its borders. Because of the biblical command for Christians to obey the governing law. Let me back up. It is not a sin to protect your borders. But I'm not saying the Bible commands us to build walls. The walls protected the borders. So what I'm saying is, it is really biblical for a nation to protect its borders. Now, a country can pass laws that they won't protect their borders. But I'm just saying, from what I read in scripture, it is wise to protect your borders. It is wise for you to lock your house up when you go to bed. <laughs> it is wise for you to control who enters your house where you live. Now, that's just me. You can't have people you don't know running, running, running up in and out of there any, any time of the day. Um, so it seems to be some wisdom from God for a nation to protect its borders. So because of the biblical man for Christians to obey the governing laws, and the biblically demonstrated necessity for a nation to protect its borders, the, the U.S. immigration laws do not force Christians to violate any command of God. For these reasons, the immigrant who has illegally entered the country, and they're a Christian now, talking about Christians who have illegally entered a country, Christians, people who know God, people that just love them some Jesus. <laughs> For these reasons, the immigrant who has entered, illegally entered a country is in sin. And they have violated Romans 13, 1 through 2, a text which commands Christians to, to submit to governmental laws. All sin has negative consequences. The same is true for the sin of illegal immigration. Negative results, negative consequences when a Christian is in the United States illegally are, number one, the temptation to lie and deceive regarding their legal status. If you are a Christian and you're here and you didn't come in the right way and the authorities show up in your house and say, they say, did you enter in the right way? And you know you didn't. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Last time I checked, that's called lying. Mm. Amen. I got one mm. <laughs> One amen. But that's why I read tonight, preach the word. Be in season, out of season, improve, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have the ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. But you be sober in all things. And so I'm trying to be sober in this issue also. So 
first thing is you're going to be tempted to lie and deceive regarding your legal status. Now, the second thing, thought, theft, or fraud to avoid paying taxes and other fees. It is biblical to, we're, we're commanded by God to pay our taxes. Romans 13 and um, I started five. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers are servants of, of God, devoting themselves to this very thing, render to all that is due them, tax to whom taxes do, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom Honor. So if you're here and not paying taxes, if you're, and you're a Christian, you're just in sin. If I can get one more more amen, I'm going to Y'all are be real funny. And then there's the constant distress. The worrying over being caught by home security or ICE agents or whoever else. Uh, is responsible for immigrants that come into the borders of the United States. Like any other sin, disobeying governing, disobeying governing immigration laws. Do we all agree when you when you sin by disobeying government, it's all it's always a price to pay. Yes. Amen. So when you run the red light on purpose, what do you do? No, no, no. What you, no, if you don't get a ticket still, when you run a light, what do, you, what do we always do? Why, why do we look this way and look that way? We know what's going on. We look at the same, but policemen saw us do it. Because we know what's wrong. And so our point is there's always consequences for sin, no matter how small, quote unquote, small it may be. So. The reason why when we deliberately run a light, and I've done it, you know, you gotta stop light three in the morning and they make it make no sense to me to stand here. And so what do I do? I look in my rear view mirror. I do, I do like motor. I look this way. And I look that way. And I don't finally see nobody. I cruise on through. But it was sin. And if the police caught me, I had no argument, no defense, just pay the fine. So this is what I'm saying. Whenever Christians are in sin, there's always a consequence, and it even includes Christians who are, they, they are here illegally. There's always a consequence to disobeying God. Like any sin, disobeying govern, governing immigration laws is essentially disobeying God and requires one to confess and forsake the sin. Wow. Repentance of this sin will manifest itself in a pro, proactive attempt to make the situation right. This is how we deal with all sin. Amen. When you uh, repent and confess your sin, then you're supposed to go about some steps to making the situation right. Mm -hmm. And you don't say, I, I, you know, please forgive me, I'll punch you in the nose. I'm sorry, forgive me, and then slap <laughs> No, you go about doing things. So repentance of this sin will manifest itself in a proactive attempt to make the situation right. Either by obtaining legal status through appropriate means, or by leaving the country until legal immigration status can be obtained. Now if there's another way for you to stay legally, seek that out. My point is that you are a Christian. Seek to do it right. Amen. Seek Amen. to do it God's way. Because when you don't, as in any other sin, it normally doesn't turn out well for you. Christians must educate themselves in immigration laws and other vital facts regarding the entry of non-U.S. persons into the United States. Regardless of political affiliation, Christians must be willing to admit that the United States government has been inconsistent in enforcing immigration laws, resulting in widespread corruption and contradiction. Note the truth of Proverbs 29, 12. If a ruler pays attention to falsehood, all his ministers become wicked. Wow. I mean, 
God directly addresses that. When leaders don't obey the laws of their own land that they establish, then all the, the all of their uh, under I don't know what you want to call them their their um, under deputies or what I don't know what you want to call them all the people who work under these positions they also become wicked. So God has something to say about all of this, and we need to dig and find out what God says, and that as Christians, good. Uh, uh, believe in Christians because love is in Jesus. <laughs> you know, we, we, we need to stay with the truth of the scripture, right? The Bible, of course. Amen. When political leaders fail to obey existing laws, wickedness will prevail throughout the land. <coughs> the truth of Proverbs 29 12 is evident in the confusion and current mass hysteria we see in the United States concerning illegal immigration. Amen. Amen. Because the federal government has been inconsistent and ineffective to enforce immigration laws, enforce the laws, the enforcement of the laws varies from state to state, from city to city, created complexity with specific immigration cases. Christians must be educated and informed to intelligently approach this issue. Let me stop. God's people, those who know Christ as Savior. In other words, somewhere along the line, you have repented of your sins and placed genuine saving faith in Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. Old things pass away, all things become new. The Holy Spirit takes up residence on the inside. And as Jesus said, he begins to lead you and guide you into all truth. Christians should be some of the most objective, simple people on the earth. Amen. Anybody disagree with that? Amen. Because that's the way Jesus was. <laughs> we never see Jesus out of control, acting like he didn't lost his mind. <laughs> and so we should be, we need to be educated, we need to be informed to intelligently approach. Um, this issue. And I'm going to get to the fifth footnote, but I'm going to first say this. If Christians only respond to these issues from a politically left or politically right bias, or blindly accept misinformation often reported by various news outlets, it will be impossible for believers to fulfill the command of Christ to be the salt of the earth, or the difference between civility and insanity engulfing a nation. You cannot be the salt of the earth. And remember, I, I, well, a couple Sundays I'm teaching through Matthew 5, 6, 7. Remember, Jesus said, uh, uh, Matthew 5, what is it, 13? You are the salt of the earth. Um, salt did not totally eradicate decay in meat, but it slowed down the process of the king. So when the Lord says we are the salt of the earth, we are supposed to be the ones slowing down the rot and ruin of society. Yes. You can't do that if you are misinformed. Yes. God is calling us to be civil and intelligent and informed children of God. Now having said this, I told you when they started discussing all of this border stuff, I just sat down one evening. I spent about four or five hours just reading. And what I discovered was two specific, I mean footnote number five, two specific court cases in the Ninth District Court of Appeals are the root cause of the problem that exists today in relationship to the United States and its southern borders. They are Flores versus Meese, former Attorney General Edmund Meese in 1988, and Reno versus Flores in 1993. Both cases made it a law that all children accompanying adults who are illegally entering the United States be separated from parents until the parents' immigration status is resolved. In 1988, uh, really around 1985, there was a young girl who came across the border illegal. Lacetta Flores, I believe was her name. And they housed her with 
the adult people who had illegally immigrated. And so while she was being housed with these adult illegal immigrants, she was assaulted and I believe raped. And so I believe it was the American Civil Liberties Union sued the United States government that all children must be separated from all adults when they enter the United States illegally and the law was created to protect children from being molested and raped by these other adult illegal immigrants. <clears throat> Uh, the case came back before the uh, Ninth, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and uh, I think in the Meese case, uh, the, the time that the children could be separated from their parents, they didn't state the time. So the case was revisited again by the Ninth Circuit, and I think they said, I think 20 days or something like that, that they must be re reunited with parents. But remember, they couldn't be reunited until their parents' illegal immigration status was resolved. Problem is, there's just too many people coming over. Yeah. Uh, what is it, 30,000 a month? And they can't get to all these right. in 20 days. Most people don't know, um, both Presidents Obama and now Trump equally enforced this law by the instruction of the Ninth District Court of Appeals. I don't think President Obama separated as many, but he did separate some. So I'm going to be fair. So in June 2018, President Trump, by executive order, he violated the Ninth District Court of Appeals by mandating children not be separated from parents who had illegally entered the United States. So right now, technically, they're in violation of the Ninth District. This is all being controlled by the Ninth District Court of Appeals. I have not heard any of this being explained on any of the major networks, news corporations, inclusive of Fox, CNN, MSNBC in any significant way. And both you and I know Christians watch this stuff and pay more attention to this junk than they do the Word of God on Sunday morning. So we have to educate ourselves to respond to these things intelligently. And I still say, if you're only watching Fox, CNN, MSNBC, or whatever, the other ones, rather than developing the mind of Christ by staying on your knees and in your scriptures, and then God moving you to research for yourself so we as children of God can be the salt of the earth and address these issues without jumping into the mad frenzy we see today none of this is going to be resolved. Church leaders must also become well, well, church leaders must also become informed and educated with state and regional laws to address those in congregations who may be in the United States illegally. By doing so, church leaders will avoid providing counsel that may violate existing law and complicate matters for believers in their congregation who may be unauthorized immigrants. Um, one of the good sources I had to, to do this was from uh, Dr. John McCarthy because they're in L.A. and they've had to deal with a lot of illegal immigrants in the church. So it, it was a good source for me to try to think about these things biblically and in a reasonable, rational way. Congregants and church leaders must understand that it is vital that the nation control its borders in immigration practices, and example is for public health reasons. Before persons can might immigrate into the United States, he or she or they must be quarantined and checked for the following contagious diseases. Uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, gonorrhea, leprosy, that's the one where you get a disease and your nose falls off, or your ears fall off, or your foot falls off. It's the same kind of leprosy Jesus was healing people of in the New Testament period. Most of us don't know, but it's still out there. Cholera, diphtheria, infectious tuberculosis, and I was shocked at this one, the Black Plague. 
and I got on the CDC website and got this information. The Black Plague, I think it killed at one time, what, 30% of your population? Wasn't it something like that? So there are places where there's still outbreaks of the Black Plague. People have to be checked for this stuff before they come in and move next door. <laughs> Viral hemorrhagic fever, that's where you get this virus and your blood doesn't clot. And you just bleed the death out your nose, your eyes, every opening in your, your pores. It, it's like getting bit by one of these venomous snakes. And there's some snakes have a, um, their venom is, is, is an anti-coagulant agent. And you just bleed to death. So this thing, you'll be bleeding out your eyes, your nose, your mouth, bleed through your pores. Um, uh, 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 your rectum, everything, and you just bleed to death. Uh, uh, severe acute respiratory syndrome and pandemic flu virus. After immigrants have been quarantined and cleared from having any of these infectious diseases, uh, they must then undergo an extensive vaccination process that includes inoculation for mumps, measles, rubella, polio, tetanus, pertussis, rotavirus, rotavirus Hepatitis A and B, meningitis, varicella, influenza, and pneumonia. Because of these public health concerns, the control of borders and immigration is a necessity to avoid outbreaks from life-threatening diseases. How many of you have heard this, any of this on the news? How many of you have heard any Republican politicians mention this? How many of you have heard any Democratic politician mention this? But you heard the preacher tonight. Amen. Amen. Somebody needs to make some sense out of this mess. And let me move on. <laughs> and eventually these things will always happen. If, if, if uh, as an historian, I know all of these diseases, well, some of them I don't even know what they are, I have time to look them up. A lot of them I know what they are, and I know historically there have been outbreaks of these in the past. It always happens. And so it's just a matter of time. So because of these public health concerns, the control of borders and immigration is a, is a necessity to avoid outbreaks from life-threatening diseases. In conversations that I heard from those on the political right and political left regarding illegal immigration, I've not heard any discuss or debate from any political or news outlet regarding pandemic consequences to the United States. If those entering illegally are never quarantined or inoculated, there is increased potential of a public health crisis in which many could die from diseases that have historically killed millions in geometric proportions. What that means is it starts off with one, in a day, six got it, in another day, 30 got it, in another day, 80, in another day, before you know it, it's out of control. And so this is why nations must protect their borders. Just let me move on. Teach, Pastor. Christians must avoid divisive public rhetoric and instead educate themselves to bring godly, biblical civility to these discussions. Most of the political discussions I see on, and I don't like to get on it anymore, Facebook and all this other stuff. What I'm seeing is people arguing with the deck chairs of the Titanic. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Does it make any difference whether you're sitting on the left side of the Titanic or the right side? Would it have made a difference? <laughs> the, the wisest comment I ever heard, and I keep listening to it over and over and over. I told Brother Aiden I had to look, I looked at it. I listened to it Sunday morning before I came to church. It was about a two minute and 50 second comment I heard from the late Malcolm Muggeridge, who was considered uh, one of the greatest journalists who ever lived. Uh, he became a believer late in his life, strong believer. And uh, he made a comment in an in a interview he did 50 years ago, in 1968. And he was talking about then churches not preaching the gospel, but uh, 
really running political agendas in the church. And he made this statement, and it's, it's stuck with me. And he said this. All earthly causes always end in total disappointment. But on the other hand, he said, I mean, we have one of the greatest jobs there is. Enabling man, as inadequate as we are, to come to an understanding of God. Amen. There is no more noble pursuit. And that's the that's and that's and that's the mission that God has given the church. And then we can we we, 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 we study, we learn God's ways and then all of us go out in society and, and we're the salt of the earth and all of these issues. Amen. I'm not seeing that right now. The church's responsibility regarding the citizenship status of immigrants. <sighs> there is no scriptural expectation for the local church to take on the role of informant, investigator, or law enforcer regarding the immigration status of anyone. This is especially true of some who are living in the United States illegally and attending a local church. The responsibility for enforcing immigration laws are for those in government positions who are given the legal authority to investigate and enforce the various immigration laws. I have no desire to try and investigate what's going on in your house. <laughs> you better find out what's in you. I don't hardly waste my time when somebody calls me up with some junk, unless I say, I will sit down with him while you confront him, because you said you saw him. I didn't. We'll do this the scriptural way, you know. First, you confront him on your own. If they don't respond, then come back with two or three in my house. Amen. Yes. And then, then if they don't want to do it that, then we're bringing trouble. I mean, God, and every time I say, oh, no, I can't do that, well, I can't do nothing either. <laughs> My point is, I am not, I'm not a, a, a CIA, I, I'm not a CIA, I'm not an FBI, I'm not ICE. So I'm not investigating anybody. I'm a preacher commanded to preach the gospel and try to dig in the Bible and instruct the church, the choir, on how we, we can biblically think about these issues and address them and then the world will look at us and say, man, those Christians got to go, they, they, they got, they, they got some. Amen. The role of the church is to faithfully proclaim the truth of the scriptures and then trust the Holy Spirit to convict the hearts of Christians who are in the United States illegally. Those of us who believe in the doctrine of scripture alone must trust the fact that the truth, uh, uh, must trust the fact that the truth we see in Hebrews 4.12 applies to all sin, including the sin of illegal immigration. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and narrow, marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Preach the word, and, and God will convict who needs to be convicted of whatever sin they're in. Amen. Sin, preach the word. You can preach on a sermon and it ain't got nothing to do with what they're doing and they still get convicted. Amen. I don't know how many times I've had that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't care, Pastor. Whatever you're talking about, all I can think about is my thing. First of all, I know who told me. Who told me? <laughs> who told me? I ain't, ain't nobody told me nothing. <laughs> it's amazing how good God can do his job. Amen. 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 Yeah. Yeah. But we, it's not good enough for us. It's not pragmatic enough. If someone is convicted in their heart of their legal status, the church must be prepared to give them aid and counsel in the following areas. Number one, provide prayer and counsel to those who are struggling with submitting to governing authorities. I personally believe this is best accomplished through church leadership, pastors and elders, because most folks are not equipped to do this. You can't have everybody doing this. Because most Christians think we can't help ourselves because politics trumps the scriptures from the right and the left. And so you can't trust them to tell people right. So it needs to be somebody seasoned in the faith. The private council should seek to encourage unauthorized immigrants to submit to the scriptures by obeying governing authorities 
concerning the various immigration laws. The church should never provide legal counsel unless there's a church member who is a licensed attorney who can provide counsel under the umbrella of attorney-client confidentiality. When someone asks for legal counsel but no legal professional is a member of the church congregation, it is the responsibility of church leadership to help the legal immigrants find the appropriate counsel. Come out, say it, and in your church. So don't call me afterwards and ask me to form a, 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 a I, mean, I know somebody in the Youngstown guy said, well, right now all I can help is the word of God. <laughs> That's my call right now. Amen? Amen. Um, it is the responsibility of church leadership to help illegal immigrants find the appropriate legal counsel who specializes in immigration law or a general attorney who can direct them to the proper legal specialist. Three, it is wise for the church, the local church, to never install an illegal immigrant as pastor or elder since one of the requirements of these positions is they must be above reproach as is taught in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 2. It is a trustworthy statement if a man aspires to the office of overseer. It is a fine work he desires to do. An overseer then must be above reproach. It's not good to have somebody on the staff. <coughs> and if a policeman just, I don't know, accidentally comes in there, you know, for whatever, not even that, he's scurrying out the door. Because <laughs> they're worried, I'm, I'm here, am I making sense? I'm, I'm here legally, I do nothing, and, and you're up in the weeds in there. Is it gone? <laughs> then you come back and finish teaching your Sunday school. <laughs> I mean, we got to be wise about this stuff. I mean, I, I, I hope I'm making sense. So, 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 I guess nowadays, before we ordain somebody, first we got to ask them proof your citizen. I don't know. Because we can't, because, because, you know, we're a small church and we can't afford no big, 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 you know, you, you know, so we're being proactive here, amen? Let me move on. <laughs> Minister Fonzie got me funny back there. I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> He's my coattail at the church. He's my coattail. Um, four, if a believer who is an illegal immigrant is convicted of being disobedient to government, I'm talking about not legal, convicted by the Holy Spirit on the inside, and they are determined to return to their country of origin and come back in the United States legally, it is the responsibility of the church to do its best to help them in this transition. This may include financial assistance to travel back to their native place of residence. In matters of illegal immigration, the church must deal with this issue according to the gospel rather than a political agenda. The church must affirm that Christians should be informed, contributing citizens who have the right to vote on these issues according to his or her conscience. Hopefully, each individual Christian follows a conscience that seeks to view all things according to the scriptures, rightly divided, rather than inferior worldviews of either the political right or political left. I need one amen. And I'll amen. amen. There, there you go. Now, even though you didn't mean it, let me move on. <laughs> It is the responsibility of the church as directed in Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all uh, that I commanded you. So, so, so our number one responsibility to the legal immigrant is really to give them the gospel. Amen. Just because you're a legal immigrant, it will stop you from being saved right. and coming to know Jesus. And then, as you come to know Jesus, let's let him work this thing out. Right. To where you won't be running for cover. Right. <laughs> and peeping out the weeds and ask, are they gone? And come back and finish your Sunday school lesson. Amen. <laughs> However, it is unbiblical and a distraction from the gospel and the great commission. For the church to advocate political activism on issues such as this. 
What I'm saying is this. Um, not everybody's a preacher, not everybody's a pastor. Mm -hmm. You as a layman, you may work in one of these positions, um, these, these positions where this is what you do. You deal with illegal immigrants and whatnot. See, our job is to make you be the salt of the earth in the midst of that. And conduct yourselves as God would have you. And be the salt of the earth wherever you are at. And make an impact for Christ wherever you are at. See, this is the, this is the job of the church. This is my job. To educate you so you can go out and be the salt of the earth in regards to these things and do things God's way. But we can't, the church cannot get into political activism on issues such as this. The reason for this is twofold. A, a local church where most of its members oppose illegal immigration runs the risk of viewing unauthorized immigrants as the enemy rather than a part of its mission to evangelize through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two, a local church where most of its members advocate increased rights for illegal immigrants run the risk of enabling insubordination to God-ordained government authority as revealed in Romans 13, 1 through 2 and, and through this being judgment upon themselves. Let me read it again. Let everyone be subject to the government authority, for there is no authority except that which, has, which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. Amen. Incidentally, when Paul wrote that, they had one of the worst emperors on record. Caligula. Crazy Khalil, who, 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 who nominated his horse as a Roman senator. <laughs> and was, and was, and was, had a harem of boys, called him minerals, because he liked to go swimming with them and do ungodly things. This was who, this was who was over the government, but even that government, when their law did not conflict with God, the Holy Spirit through Paul said, submit. Because if you don't, you are opposing God, and you will bring condemnation upon your sins. In both above positions, the mission of the church becomes blurred when political issues are more important than the faithful proclamation of the gospel and the consistent teaching and preaching of the word of God handled accurately. One thing I haven't mentioned, the Bible does talk about when the alien was in the land. When the alien was in the land, they would be treated just as everybody else. Mm -hmm. The reason why I didn't deal with that because back in Israel, the aliens who were in the land are those who came in mm -hmm. through the open gate. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They had walls around all these cities. So then, you know, they're not talking about the ones who snuck in. So if an alien came in, God said, you should be just and equitable to the aliens. This is why uh, Ruth and Naomi, they were, they were gleaning. Remember that? Because God said to Israel, when you harvest your crop, don't harvest it all. They had to leave a certain amount there for the alien and the widows and the strangers who were visiting the land in order that they could eat and find rest and comfort. So God did provide for those who were there the right way. Right. So I haven't mentioned that because it's not the tough it's the subject. But I'm just throwing that at you because I, I see some of y'all thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, in relationship to immigration issues, there is no room in the church for racism, prejudice, and hatred. The church must strongly denounce any perspective on immigration, illegal or legal, based on racist or prejudicial grounds. In other words, it should never enter the lips of a Christian. Never! Not, don't let it be named once a month. We can't have all these Mexicans running around here. <laughs> never. May it never be us. As, as Paul
Paul would say, God forbid, may it never be. That's not who we are. <coughs> Whoever else it is. As Christians, we must affirm the biblical truth that all people, regardless of immigration status, have been created by God and therefore bear his image. Any Christian caught up in racial bigotry and height and the height produced by the political left or the political right, let me say it again, any Christian caught up in racial bigotry and height produced by the political left or political right is in deep sin and rebellion against the image of God stamped in every human being. The solution for Christians caught up in this ugly race of sin is repentance. Lord, Lord, questions, comments? I'm going to tell you how I messed up I am going to this show. But be nice. <laughs> You're going to tell me how I messed up I am. Be nice. Amen. So I just want to speak to the medical piece of this, and I don't want to give my relative or their physician away. But when it talks about these contagious diseases, one of the things they're finding out in the hospital is they can't report this to the CDC because the... Um, the illegals that are over here don't have ID, so when they come in and they have these contagious diseases, they can't come back, they can't be told that they have this disease because they're illegal. So they're just floating out there, and we don't know. So let me, let me, let me understand. You, so you have a person that work, they work in the medical field. So let me, I didn't know this. So if there's an illegal immigrant and they go to the hospital, and they have the bubonic plague, Mm -hmm. So the hospital can't tell the illegal immigrant. Yeah, they can't tell them, you know, because, you know, it takes like hours for them okay. to get back in touch with them. So they can't even get back in touch with them to tell them they have this to treat them. And then that illegal person can't, you know, it's call for information because they don't have any ID. So it's, it's just out there. And the, and the big one is tuberculosis, syphilis, and gonorrhea. Wow. Syphilis, tuberculosis, and gonorrhea. Mm. You know, thankfully they have effective treatments for for, for some. There, well, there, there are some forms of gonorrhea that are antibiotic resistant, right? But you know, I, 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 I must be honest with you. You know that that black plague concerned me. <laughs> yeah. you know, bubonic plague turned you know you, you turn black and blue and then die. That does concern me. I don't want to be running around here. Look at me, son. You want to bleed out my eyes. What's wrong with you, Pastor? Let me move on. Questions, comments? Sister Gloria. When we, um, when Curry stayed with us for two years in Florida, and she, uh, we arrived in Florida on like, uh, Sunday night. So Monday morning, I went to register her for school. And she had all the shops. And they told me, no way. And I said, she's got a shop. Because she's going to go through all this again. And we both are like, what? And they said, well, you know, there's so many people come from all over Guatemala, you know, um, in all the, the Spanish uh, countries, and even uh, Russia, whatever. And um, if your child does not have their, you know, room shots, they become such of any kind of seat. So we spent a whole day running from health department to office to health department. And then the next morning, we had to finish up with these shots. And she was an American child who had already had her shots. But that was for protection, the woman explained to me. Well, I, I did some reading on that. But I, you know, you, you guys, you got, you got this much work. I've been studying this for a year, at least this one month of teaching. But um, the reason why they do that is because they have people on the black market who yes. will sell an illegal immigrant phony documents yeah. stating <coughs> they've had all this vaccination, they've been checked for all these things. Yeah. And so before they come over here, the black market people will sell them phony documents that look legitimate that they've been checked for all this. So that's why, regardless of whether you have a document or not, you have to be checked for these things. Brother Gray. Um, now you know there's a, there's a lot of stuff on the news that went on. <coughs> There's a lot of stuff on the news at one time about um, churches and stuff providing 
a safe haven. Now, those that did that is in the violation of Romans 13.2. They're in sin. Look, <laughs> we're all sitting up here in church. And a guy walked up in there sitting on the front row, he hatcheted 30 people to death. He's in violation of the law. Us being obedient to the law of the land about turning in serial killers because they might go upside your head with the action. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, where, where do we, where, where are we getting this? We need to, where are we getting this stuff from that it's our responsibility to house people? By us violating the law of God, to help them continue violating. Because they say the church is supposed to love it. Well, we can witness to them. We'll witness. Well, brother, you need to be saved by covering by cover the brothers holding down. <laughs> I preach on with the Bible, the gospel, and say you need to be saved, and, and don't you know, and give them the gospel, and you know, and and, and, and you know, and hold them down, and when the police get here, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're laughing. I know, but you sure. sat there next to me, first of all. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to know how the brother looks, okay? okay. Is he married? Does he have children? That's all I want to do. <laughs> Are you being compassionate 
and loving when you are doing something that clearly violates the law of God? Um, I, I can't answer that directly, but I'm going to answer it. I'll try to in an indirect way. Um, a, another story. If I was living in 1950 or 60, mm -hmm. and um, I was living in Georgia, mm -hmm. and um, I couldn't go to a certain fountain or whatever because I was I was black, mm -hmm. you know, or the school or what have you, I might have broken the law because I felt that I'm human and have just as much right as my you know white mm -hmm. counterpart. Well, well, now now we're dealing with what I talked about before. When, when, when a law breaks the law of God, um, we follow the law of God. We ought to obey God rather than man. Okay. Now, um, we have to find a way of being compassionate and loving and be obedient to God at the same time. And it can be done. But, but, but we can't, we can't, our compassion We, can, we can't violate the law of God through compassion. Our compassion is not the standard for truth. We are commanded to be compassionate, but my compassion towards somebody is never the standard for truth. The truth is scriptures. And so, first of all, this is an extremely complex issue. The answers are not easy. Um, um, but I have to believe if God has commanded us to live this way and approach this this way, there has to be a solution whereby we can honor God and be compassionate to people at the same time. I just believe, I believe that exists. I don't think they'll work it out. But I but I but I I know my God. And I know this is within this this is this is this is consistent with who he is. So um, and, 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 and I want to piggyback, and I think what the sister is, is saying is these are complex issues. These are complex issues. And this is why it requires us as Christians to think deeply about these things. Prayerfully, according to a biblical worldview, um, but I still say, and I will say this, um, I don't care to go past that. Um, we can't look to the world to guide our thinking on these things. Amen. And let me go and say this, and I'm not saying you're saying this. But the world now has even defined, the world has not even defined love for us. The world has defined love for the church, and we're following that definition. The world has defined what compassion is. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but a lot of times Christians, we are living by a love that is foreign to scripture. And we're living through a compassion which is foreign to scripture. That's how bad it is in the church. For example, love today is, is if anything you want to do after yourself. That's love today. You know, uh, my dad was in got my dad had to go to the hospital. He has no money to pray for him. But I was in the emergency room with him, and so the, the, the girl came in there to um, check him in. And she, she, see, because he can't talk for himself, he has all time. So I'm asking questions. She says, first thing she said was, uh, she looked at him, she looked at me, and she said, she wanted to mark the box race. She looked at him with a little bit of race. I'm like, can't you tell? <laughs> I mean, they're asking stuff like this, male or female. And I'm like, can't you see? Well, they have to ask it now because you get to 
choose which one you are. Today, love is I accept uh, since she messed with me, I'm not sir. I accept Sister Diane. Sister Diane says she's a six foot five <laughs> NFL linebacker. In, I mean, a chemical, but in, the, the love is, I have to accept that. She's, she sees herself as six foot five, a linebacker. By gosh, God has commanded us. So the word has defined love, and, but they, it's a love separated from the truth of God. She loved it. We telling her sister, you are not six five, <laughs> and you're not a man. God made you a woman, a beautiful woman. That's who you are, and God expects you. That's the way you're supposed to be. So that's love, because if you keep living like that, you're gonna bring the wrath of God upon you. That's love. According to not not the world. That's what I just said in the world. Like right? you just, oh, he's a mean, he's a mean man. Huh? Takes me. <laughs> so, 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 but I want to get back to you. We have to find a way to be compassionate. But our desire to be compassionate should never transcend what God requires of us. We submit to Him first. And we have to find a way to be compassionate as we submit ourselves to God in His Word. And that never means violating God. Brother Shane. Um, I think often, um, even Christians, we tend to forget, you know, about the verse that says, you know, if, if your eye causes you to stumble, cast it out. Because it's better to, you know, enter into heaven with, without an eye than to enter into hell with both eyes. So often, you know, it seems like we just want to Um, well, yeah, I mean, honestly, attempting to appease everyone else. Well, when the church loses its power, when it starts to, when it starts to take on, you know, what the world wants, um, when when the, when the church starts to take up, you know, the mission of anything other than bringing souls to Christ, the church weakens itself, and I think we get caught up with. It would be a rough life to grow up in Mexico right now. Yes. But it's temporary. You know, where where you end up in the eternal you know, for eternity is eternal. what's most important. Yes. Right. And when the church starts to make other things its focus, its its focus is not saving souls, which is ultimately the most important thing because no matter how bad your life is here, yeah. it would be better to have the, the worst life on earth Why and, and head to, you know. Why saying? I mean, Jesus said you'd be better off going to uh, heaven with minus an eye, a hand, and a foot than have all this. I just read that today. You can cast your whole body cast in hell. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I want to make it known. I don't think Brother Shane is saying it's not significant okay. or it's, it's, it's unimportant that these people in these other countries are really suffering. They are. They are. And as, as concerned Christians, that, that, that is supposed to be a concern to us. And if we can help address that, we do. But that is never to supersede the gospel. Because as you said, you can live as a billionaire and have everything and go to hell. <laughs> or you can be the poorest person out of the roughest life and spend eternity with the Lord. And I guarantee you, once you see Jesus, that poverty you went through yeah. ain't gonna mean a thing. Yeah. But if you end up in hell, <laughs> that billion dollars you lived on, guess what it's gonna mean to you? Yeah. Not a thing. So, actually, the comment chain. Um, to, to go back to the sister's question or comments um, about the difficulty of seeing people who are coming across the United, the Southern world, especially because they're wanting a better life and to have compassion. There are examples in scripture, I think it goes back to in your lecture where you said that we must obey the word of God and that there are consequences. So regardless if it's illegal immigration or anything, God has set in motion um, an order 
of authority for a reason. And we may not fully understand that, mm -hmm. but oftentimes it comes down to just simply trusting the word of God. So the word of God says that we are to obey governmental laws as long as those laws do not um, infringe on the, the law and, and being obedient to the word of God. There is a reason why he has that in place. And I want to go back in, in specifically addressing some of the comments. When you read through the Old Testament, especially in the book of Joshua, when they were going into the land that God had promised them, and God basically said, utterly wipe out the people who, who, who have resided in those uh, lands for generations. And you're reading that, you're like, whoa. You know, but when you see where they didn't follow God, and they showed tolerance, they showed compassion, and they did not utterly wipe out a people, those people came back to haunt them generations down the road. And so there are- To this day. To this day. To this day. day. <laughs> and so there are consequences for not following the word of God, even when it seems <coughs> that what God expects from us seems hard, you know, or callous or whatever. There is a reason, especially if you trust that God in his sovereignty and in his, in, his, in his love for us, there is a reason why. And even when you went through and showed about, um, or discussed the quarantines and the inoculations, the vaccinations and all that, who, who, who thinks of that? You know? Right, right. Yeah, I'm saying, that you, but you, 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 can, you can have compassion on five people. If you were living on the southern border of the, or Texas, and you're like, okay, I'm gonna let five people sneak in, I'm gonna house them in my, in my home showing compassion, and then they leave, and your whole family is, is diseased right. and killed. Leprosy. You've shown compassion, but at what cost? And, and so I, I just want to go back and say, it, when I read the Old Testament, and I see how the children of Israel came out of the wilderness, claimed the land that God had promised them, and utterly white, and were right, wiping out whole nations, that seemed like it's hard to swallow, but you have to trust God. They're, the one they did, they said, man, we've been in this a long time, and we don't want to fight no more. They said, let's just make peace, let's just, and it, 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 it's haunting them to this day. Something that happened 3,000 years ago. So, um, you know, God's ways on our ways. Said that in the Bible, his thoughts aren't our thoughts, his ways, but his way, his way is always the best. And there are things we can't see, God can. And it seems like God permits harsh things, but we don't know how God is going to use this. God permits Joseph to be sold into slavery. Joseph said to his brothers, You meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. And he took that and he used that. But he, he spent years in jail and just a slave. But these things are difficult, but the same thing, be obedient to God, and at the end of the day, you'll, you'll be all right. So it's a friend. So Pastor, you're saying that, but let me ask it this way. Is it ever okay, or would it ever be okay for a, a church to protect immigrants. Not if immigrants are if they if there are immigrants and they're seeking asylum the right way. It's, it is it is not wrong for a local church to help. There's a person in their congregation, they're a legal immigrant. It is not a sin. It would be it would not be a sin for us to help that person be able to stay in this country the right way. Because that's what we want. We don't want to constantly look over their shoulder and, and, and so and so look, this is why this mess we're in today is because neither the right nor the left will deal with it. I know we think it's one or the other, but I'm telling you, it's not. I did a lot of reading, and it's both. It's both. 
And I wouldn't be surprised at the end of the day, after they have us fighting against each other, they don't go out to the bar and have a drink. We probably got these stupid people fighting against each other. I give you the sense from both that it's not about the people. There is economic. Of course. You know, there is one side, one side wants the cheap labor. Yeah, right. And the other side wants the votes. But it's not compassion. It's, it's no, power. no, no. It, it, it's, it's, it's really a mess. Did somebody else have it? Did you have anything? Brother Grace, did you have anything? Well, I was thinking that where do we get our like? You say that it should be that middle ground. Now, there are certain policies that people put in place. Well, I have a thing about the separation of children from their parents. Separation of what? Children from their parents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I say, it seems to me there should be a way that you can detain people, keep them, obey the law, but not separate them. I know they did that with the Japanese and the tournaments in yeah. the Second World War. I, I, look, I agree there has to be a way to do that. The problem we have right now is when they had an opportunity to do it, they didn't do it. Now, they probably thought they were doing this Lisa Flores some good, because she had been housed with the adult illegal immigrants, and she got molested. So I think they thought they were doing the kids a favor by doing this, but now it's turned into a complete mess. So there has to be a way that they can work this out. But now, now, now I'm talking about opinion. I'm not talking about scripture. From what I've read and studied, I am not convinced either side really wants to do that. There's something they're getting out of this, and it's not compassion, it's not this. And, 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 and normally, it's, 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 it's something else. So we have to see God and see what would maybe be the best thing to stand for those policies. Absolutely. But there are other children in this country. Yeah. My daughter works in a yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's complicated. It's, it's extremely complicated. And, um, I still say the church needs to find out God's way and stand on it regardless of the consequence. Because at the end of the day, God's way is always right. We're going to have a one or two more, and then we're going to. Sister Brianna, then I'll go to first grade. Um, just kind of going off of what we were just saying, it's not really compassion that's driving the conversation. I think it's not a one or the other. Like, if you really have compassion for people, you'll find a way to help them in a way that you should be helping them. So instead of housing somebody in your house, why don't you contribute to charities or organizations that are helping where they live so that it's better and they don't have to. Dangerous can't move to America because then America becomes dangerous. It's like there's a reason that we have borders and it's like you can help people build a better home where they're at and that would be a better solution for everyone. Look, look, look. Um. Here we go again. I don't want to sound harsh. The church, we are to help where we can. And we can do it a godly biblical way. But we should resign ourselves to certain things. While we work for justice, while we try to help, we need to resign ourselves to this. It's the last lecture that God has clearly stated that this earth is headed towards destruction. Amen. There'll be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, pests, men's hearts failing them for fear of things coming upon them, the sea and the waves roaring. Know this also, in the latter days, men shall depart from the way of deceiving and being deceived. In the last days, men will be boasters, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. And so, and so we're, we're, we're in the midst of a world We've been commanded by God to do right. But we need to understand, we are not going to save this world. 
So we help when we can, but we need to, we need to, as we do these good works according to scripture, we need to understand this whole mess is destined to be destroyed because it's so messed up. Nobody but Jesus could unravel it and straighten it out at his return. So, so let's not forget, we're the church, we're not bringing in paradise. Utopia, we cannot be. It's not coming until Jesus gets here. So, so Brother Greg, and then we're going on. Was um, President Trump uh, correct in according to the law uh, to separate those children from their parents? I'm going to answer this like this because I don't want to get into the name of Trump or whoever. Bang. I'm going to answer it like this because I did the research. All the presidents since this law was passed in 85 to a certain degree have obeyed that law and separated children from parents. Some of them have been Republicans, some of them have been Democrats. I'm gonna answer it that way because I'm not getting caught up in this Trump, Obama, not from this pulpit. But I will say, all of the presidents who, ever since the ninth, that this is being controlled by the ninth district court of appeals, every president, to some degree, has followed what the ninth circuit said and separated children. Yes, sir. Hey, Pastor, just quickly, just keep in mind, you know, everyone who come across the border and claims that the mother and father and child, we don't know that they are actually their mother and father. So that's another problem you run into when you have 30,000 people a month coming across our borders. All of them aren't who they say they are. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really, to me, is like one of the issues is that we don't know that these children belong. I mean, Ohio is one of the biggest sex trafficking markets mm -hmm. in the country. So, you know, a woman and a guy come across the border with three kids, we don't know because they don't have any identification, they don't have any birth certificates, it's, it's, they don't have social security cards. We don't know that this, so yeah. should we house these children with these adults? And they may be getting, well, you know, a say it can be sex trade. We don't I, know. I, 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 you know. I don't think, I don't think God's called the church to resolve that issue. I agree. But I'm just saying that there's we certain keep men that mind. God, God they, they're going to give them. These, these, these Democrats are public, they don't give them kind of count for all this, all this stuff. Yeah. And if this ain't one, all of them will. Yeah. But we just don't take God seriously. We don't think we're going to give an account of our lives to God or anybody else. But they are. And at the end of the day, all this stuff is going to be resolved. But our job is to do what's right. And it's complicated. Yes. And this all ties into my last lecture the reason why this world is broken. We live in a broken world. And so down. All right. One sister Maya. I don't need Maya. Okay. This is family, so I got it. Got it. <laughs> oh, so I, I got it. Okay, that. so I guess just to further on like how, how much of a hot mess this is, since my mom put me on blast about my job. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> so with we're I'm dealing with what's happening right now with yes. the children being separated. Yes. So what the mess is, is there's two different laws. There's a revised code, which is this ninth district. Yes. And then there's an advised code, which I have to follow. So if we go to court, which we've had this before, and I've had families who are illegal immigrants. If I go to court, I have to, by the Ohio advised code, I have to give clear and convincing evidence that not only has a child been abused or neglected to be removed, but the trauma of removal does not outweigh the trauma of them still being in the home. Okay. So it's a hot mess because there's, and, we, and attorneys can argue that these parents are illegal immigrants and by the Ohio advised code, that is not a reason to remove a child but from the home. But the flying women is, according to the federal code, they are. But that is a, but the hot mess is, is it is a federal, the Ohio Advice Code is the Ohio Code of a federal law. So there's two federal laws 
that go against each other. Mm. And that's why we're in a mess. Right. That's what I said. So like, <laughs> all of these illegal immigrants whose children have been removed from them, each day they're removed is a day that they're spending in horrible trauma, right. which does not outweigh them being separated from their parents by the advised <coughs> law. And even if they aren't their mother and father, so it's it, not a trafficking. But it appears to me then they have, they have to work out a way when illegals come across that they, I don't, I don't know, I could keep, that you, you'd almost have to keep every family intact in their own separate facility. Because right now they got them in one big thing. Right. And, and even though kids can be there with their parents, they can still get violated. Right. I mean, even kids who are removed yeah. from American citizens, if you put them in a foster home or with a family member, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be abused, yes. assaulted, or yes. neglected in that yes. home. Yes. So it just yes. furthers that it's just a big old hot mess yes. because there's two federal laws that go exactly yes. against each other. And there's two things that are being fought about in court. But one court says it's not enough to remove but, children. But, but Ms. Maya, the, the powers that be, they know these laws contradict, don't they? Right. Mm -hmm. And they ain't doing nothing. Right. That's my point. Yeah. Both Democrats yeah. and Republicans know these laws conflict, right? Right. And they ain't doing nothing. The deck chairs in the Titanic. Right. <laughs> uh, our gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for all things today. Lord, uh, I don't claim to be an expert on these things, and I'm quite sure I have to keep working at it and digging into your word and staying before you on my knees to find out the way we need to think about these things according to your word with the very mind of Christ. Uh, Lord, lead us. Lord, guide us. Lord, we want to be compassionate, loving people, as the sister said. But we want to love you more than we love men. And so we want to submit ourselves to you. And more than anything, be right with you. And then secondarily, be right and just and fair with men. It's a complex situation. Lord, help us to think be deeply, biblically and deeply about these issues in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.